I want to introduce to you Elizabeth Talbot formally. Some of you have been with us since last evening and have heard her introduced already. Some are new for the evening. But I wanted to make one brief announcement, and that is uh, those of you who have Panda Project, which is the China mission sponsorship that uh, Audrey Falkenberg and Phil Bond were talking about, please put those cards in the baskets on the way out and they'll take note of that. And um, you know, they say, what did you hear last night about, a, or maybe it was this morning, 1,100 people were baptized last year as a result of the work of the Florida Conference missionaries. That was powerful. The thing that God gave us the privilege of being able to see almost 100 people baptized a year on the, a, a month on the average last year because of your faithfulness. That makes me very, very grateful to what God can do through sacrificial giving for overseas missions. Tonight we're blessed to have uh, Pastor Elizabeth Talbot as our speaker this evening and then tomorrow morning for worship. Pastor Talbot has served the Lord in various capacities. She's been a, an associate speaker for Faith for Today and Voice of Prophecy. She, does, she has done counseling and psychological work in industries as kind of a, a precursor to ministry. God has given her a special gift for teaching. She has a, a way of mining the Word of God, and even though she has a Ph.D. in biblical studies, she has a way of presenting it without it looking as though she is overburdened with academia in terms of it being a non-exciting presentation. She brings the vibrancy of, of the living experience with Jesus into all that she says and all that she does. So we're so happy that Pastor Talbot can be with us, that we can hear uh, her again tonight as she opens God's word, and we pray God's blessing upon her presentation. Thank you so much. Before we get started tonight with our video, we usually start with a video, I want to bring everybody up to par with what we've been doing here in camp meeting uh, since last night and this morning. We're doing pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation. I know many of you have heard seminars and charts and prophecies, but that's not what we're doing. We're just focusing on pictures of Jesus in Revelation. Pictures of Jesus for the last generation here on earth. Um, and so we have decided that we can summarize the whole Bible in two words. And for those of you that were not here, we're going to count to three and tell you what those two words are. So one, two, three. Jesus wins. Okay, now that everybody knows how we summarize not just the Bible, but also the book of Revelation, now you can join us. One, two, three, Jesus wins, because we already know the end of the story. We know how it ends. That's why we're going to rise and shine. That's why we can have a woo in our hearts, because we already know how it ends. And we say, so this is the way we summarize Revelation, Jesus wins. And if somebody asks you to summarize it in three words, how do we do that? Ta-da, Jesus wins because we can't add anything to the fact that Jesus wins, and that's it, from Genesis to Revelation. So we have been studying deeply uh, different pictures of Jesus. And before we start today, um, I am very blessed tonight because I have the opportunity that I never have to have my husband with me. He just arrived with his daughter, my stepdaughter Marina, so I'm going to ask them to stand up so you can see who they are, and I'm so happy that they are here. That's my husband, Patrick, and uh, Marina. And it's a rare, thank you so much, it's a rare thing for me to have them because I travel every weekend and usually I don't have my husband with me. But uh, Florida Conference is very attractive because Marina lives here in Florida. So that's how we ended up all together tonight and I'm very thankful for that. Um, also, I want to say hello to my dad who is probably watching today. So everybody say, hi, dad. There you go, Dad. That was for you. 
And now we're going to get started uh, because tonight, we, last night we saw that Jesus is the Alpha, the Omega, which means the A and the Z, the first and the last, the beginning at the end. This morning we saw that he's also not just the Lamb, but the Shepherd in, in chapter 7 of Revelation. And tonight we're doing the Lamb that is the victor. Now, many of you already picked up your free copies of my book on Revelation. Now, if you haven't, tomorrow the ex exhibits, the exhibitors are open from 12 to 2.30. So if you download our app of Jesus 101 in any gadget, we will give you free the book on Revelation. This is our textbook for the whole week, yeah, Thursday, Friday, and Sabbath morning. So um, if you have it, take it out now and take your Bibles. If you have iPhones with Bibles or iPads or anything else, this is the moment to take them out. In a moment, we're going to pass out some, um, some paper so you can take notes if you didn't bring yours. All of you that we have been with me already have the paper, so, but we're going to have some for you. But now we'll get started with Jesus the victor. So uh, raise your hand if you are missing paper. Uh, don't have anything to take notes with because we have people coming uh, down the aisles with paper. So raise your hand really high so we can do this very soon and get started with our study for tonight, which is the lamb as the victor. It's a victorious picture of the lamb. He's king and he's a deliverer. So uh, we're going to need more help because we have many hands up here front and the time is sticking and I have a lot to say. So please, if somebody wants to volunteer with those papers, I will really appreciate that. Yeah, because we only have four or five people giving away the paper. Thank you so much. Keep your hands up so we can do it fast. We are studying a lot of the in-depth Bible studies, the Greek words, and some very interesting things. So that's why we pass out papers so you can share with other people afterwards. Very good. I think everybody's almost ready. So you're going to need your Bible, something to take notes with, a pen or something to write, or your iPhone or your iPad, wherever you have your Bible, and can take notes. All right. Anybody else? All right, so the way we're going to start tonight is with a video of an Af African-American preacher. I love African-American preachers. They preach with all this passion. And he tries to describe Jesus as his king, which is our topic for tonight. And I have never heard a better sermon on it. So we're going to start with his sermon on Jesus is my king. And that's our topic for tonight. Thank you. How could we ever describe Jesus? Well, we're going to use a few props to try today. And um, I'm going to start with a story that I'm sure you have heard before. And the story is about uh, a fork. And I'm sure you have heard the story before. It's a woman who is dying. And this woman is preparing her memorial service and calls her pastor to prepare the service with her. Sometimes this happens, and it has happened to me too. She says, I know I'm dying in about two weeks, so I want to do this service, and I want you to get my sister to read my biography, and I would like my husband to do my, my favorite verse. And then I would like to ask you for something very strange, she said. What is that, said the pastor. Well... I would like a um, service with the open casket, and I would like you to put a fork in my hand. The pastor thought he had made a misunderstood, so he said, I'm sorry, did you say you wanted a fork in your hand? And she said, yes, I want a fork in my hand. And he said, why would you want a fork in your hand? And she says, well, let me tell you why. This is going to be my last testimony. Well, because I'm already old and we came to church, people used to bring me my food and brought the full plate, and then they would come and pick up the plate again. But if one of the people that picked up my plate when I was done told me, keep your fork, I knew, she says, that the dessert was coming and the best was still to come. She says, so everybody's going to ask you why I'm holding a fork in my hand? And it's because I know in whom I have believed, and I know that the best is still to come. What would it take for us to live or die with a fork in our hands? Yeah, woohoo, that's right. 
But you know, this story became particularly important to me in the last six months because my mother, on her trip, her last trip to the hospital, called me and said, I think this is it. And she died six months ago of cancer. And she said, don't worry about it. I'm holding a fork in my hand. And she said, I'm just going to take a little siesta, just a little nap. And the next phase, I'm going to see Jesus. So don't worry about it, she says, because I'm holding a fork in my hand, and I know that the best is still to come. What difference it makes? does it make in our lives to know that we serve someone who is already victorious? This is why we can arise and let him shine, because he's victorious. So today we're going to see two of the most victorious pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation, and we're going to learn perhaps some new things. And before we do that, I want to show you how the whole Bible is written. So I'm going to bring a graphic to the to the screen. Now, we have been studying together for a few times already, but those of you that were not here, the book of Revelation is from the first verse. It says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation, the word in Greek is apocalypsis or apocalypsis, which means to uncover. It's like we got Jesus in the first four gospels. We got his crucifixion, we got his resurrection, but we didn't realize what a cosmic uh, victory that was. So the book of Revelation starts with this word, unveiling. That's why in Spanish is apocalypsis, because that's the Greek word, apocalypsis. And, and Revelation in English tries to capture that moment in which you have a piece of art and you take the veil off. So this was like the gospel's picture of Jesus. But the book of Revelation says, let us unveil it. And then when we unveil it, you find the crown. And you find Jesus as King of kings. And you find him as Lord of lords. And you find him as victor because he suffered death and resurrected. So the book of Revelation is a book of worship. It has 16 worship scenes in which the whole universe is just praising the Lamb for redeeming the human race. Now, let's go back to the graphic. This means that every topic in the Old Testament will be brought to a ta-da in the book of Revelation. So we will find again the plagues, and again the Passover lamb, and again the lamb that was slain, and again Babylon, and all the stories of the Old Testament. It's just that we're not going to understand them in their cosmic view of what the cross actually achieved. And for those who were not here, we have 404 verses in the book of Revelation. So you can put that in your notes if you didn't have them before. 404 verses in the book of Revelation. But we have, some have counted 518 allusions to the Old Testament. Some scholars have counted more, which means that every topic in the Old Testament is brought again to John's mind, but now God says, ta-da, Jesus wins. That's why we get all the images of the Old Testament again in the book of Revelation, but now from a cosmic view. Now, this movement was started with one particular topic in mind, that we may connect the dots from the Old Testament to Jesus. We didn't always do a very good job, but everything, the Sabbath, the sanctuary, everything, has to do with our redemption in Christ. That's why this movement was raised. When we started, uh, one of them, our main founders, I think the main founder, Ellen White, wrote this for every preacher so they would never forget. And I'm going to put, uh, this is the only quote of Ellen White I'm going to give you, but it's so powerful that I want you to read it um, and perhaps take a note. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth. See, we have 28 doctrines, but we don't have 28 pearls of great price. We have one, and all the other ones are angles of this one pearl. As if you have a diamond that has many angles, but you're always studying the same thing from different angles. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth, which all of the truth uh, 
cluster around which all of the truth cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, check this out, every truth in the Word of God, from where to where, from Genesis to Revelation, must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary, and we continue. I present before you the great grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption, the Son of God uplifted on the cross. This is to be the foundation of every discourse given by our ministers. How is that for a ta-da? Uh, for a woohoo? Yes, the joy of our salvation. Every time a minister takes the pulpit, the cross has to be uplifted because this is the great truth around which all the other truth cluster. So today we're going to see two of the most victorious pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And because everybody talks about the gospel and the gospel and the gospel, and very few people make a difference between what is a weak and unbiblical gospel that says if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you might be saved, to the biblical gospel that says if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. It's a whole different type of thing. And God wanted us to live with the joy of our salvation. And today I want to tackle, to start, what is the gospel? Because Revelation 14 is a very important chapter for Adventists. Very important because we talk about the three angels' message. And at the very beginning of the three angels' message, we have that this angel is bringing the eternal gospel. So we have to know what the gospel is. So let me tell you what it is. The word gospel in English, and please take some notes so the next time somebody tells you that they're preaching the gospel, you, you have a few things to, to add. The word gospel comes from the Old English word Godspell, which means good news. And then the language contracted and we ended up with gospel, but originally it was Godspell. And it was translated from a very specific word in the Greek, which is euangelion like where we get the word evangelist. Now, what was this word used for in the Old Testament? Because this is not a word that this first angel invented or Paul invented or Mark invented when he says this is the beginning of the gospel. What was the gospel? Oh, I'm so glad you asked because we have a very important understanding behind this word. The gospel, well, most of you know this, that 200 years before Christ came to this earth, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. So the Bible that the New Testament writers used is called the Septuagint, and it's in Greek. And it uses this word back there in the Old Testament. The gospel is not a new word in the New Testament. It comes from the Old Testament. And I want to tell you what it is, and then we're going to read it. The gospel was the cry of... Oh, I'm so excited. The gospel was the cry of the person that came from the battlefield to announce to the city that their king had won. Okay? So if you were in a city, you know, all the cities were fortified or whatever, you didn't go out to battle. Your king did with the other king and their armies. And the messenger that came from the battlefield would gallop if, they, if he was on a horse or run in a particular way to let you know if it was good news or bad news. If it was bad news, you were enslaved and probably dead. If it was good news, that meant your king has won and you have been set free. That's what the word was. In Hebrew was Bashar, Bashar. In Greek was euangelion, euangelion, that is translated good news or gospel. So for you to know that the gospel is the cry that says Jesus has won. That's the word gospel. And so we find it in many places in the Old Testament, in the Greek Old Testament, but one specifically that was mentioned this week in other occasions, and I said, hey, they're using the Friday night verse, Isaiah 52, 7. Now you're going to understand it so much better because the word gospel, euangelion, is in Isaiah 52, 7. And also in other places like Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, and other prophecies, beautiful prophecies. But go with me to Isaiah 52, 7. 
Here we have, now you're going to understand why the feet are lovely. Isaiah 52, 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him, of the messenger, who is coming with what? With good news. And the word is euangelion. The word is gospel. So some of your versions say gospel. Some say good news. How lovely. You think? Of course, because that means we've been set free. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings Evangelion, the gospel, who announces peace and brings, again, the same word, the gospel of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. This is the word gospel. How lovely are the feet of those who come saying, Jesus wins, Jesus wins. You know what would happen if every church became a center of joyful cry of Jesus wins? You know, the president of the North American Division has that dream. More than doing large evangelistic meetings where people don't connect, great thing is to reap in a local church. But when we do big, big meetings, half of the people that came in go out in a year because they never connected with anybody. And he said, you know what would happen if our churches became centers of joy that are celebrating their salvation? Every neighbor would want to go and want to know what's happening in that church. How come everybody's so happy? How come everybody has a fork in their hand? Now, now that you know what gospel means, now we're going to go to Revelation 14. Because the first picture that we're going to see today is a victorious Jesus who has won. Now, I know that you have read the three angels' message many, messages many times, but chapter 14 starts with something that you have to know how it starts. If not, you're not going to interpret the three angels' message appropriately. Chapter 14, verse 1. I looked... And behold the Lamb. Now, the Lamb has many different uh, places and, and different pictures here in this book. But this is a unique one that we don't find anywhere else in the book of Revelation. Chapter 14, verse 1. I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing where? This is the only time in all the book of Revelation, that we have Mount Zion. Mount Zion is where God, which is read, would reign. This is a picture of the standing lamb who is the victor and is king and is now reigning on Mount Zion. It's very important that you know how this chapter starts because this is the victorious lamb standing in Zion. The only time in all of Revelation, the victorious lamb. And who are with him? Oh, with him are the 144,000 that we saw in chapter 7, this full number of Israel, the full symbolic number of 12 times 12. No one has been lost from chapter 7 to chapter 14. Not one is missing. They're all around the lamb, and he's reigning on Zion and they start singing. Of course they're going to sing. Are you kidding me? They're going to sing. They're going to say, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. And look what they're singing. Verse 3, they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000. Why? Because they have been purchased from the earth. The only ones that can say, Jesus wins, Jesus wins, is us. Ellen White says that the angels are going to ask us to explain to them grace because they never needed it themselves. And we're the only ones who understand what grace means because we needed it. So we start this very flamboyant, triumphant lamb standing on Zion. And then after that, of course God is going to send three more messages. How lovely are the feet of those angels that bring the final cry that says, Jesus wins, Jesus wins. This is the chapter of the three angels' message. The three angels' message comes 
bringing the eternal what? Gospel. Jesus wins. The king has won. Of course, he's standing in Zion when the chapter starts. His victor. Verse 6. I saw another angel flying in the mid heaven, having the eternal gospel. The Bashar, Bashar, Evangelion, Evangelion. Guess what? You are free because our king has won and is reigning on Zion. Now, I know that a lot of people get very confused with three angels' message, so I'm going to give you a very easy formula to remember the three angels' message. God has won. First angel. Second angel. Babylon, the other power, is down because God has won. Number three, choose Jesus because he has won. That's it. Those are the three angels' message. Jesus wins. The devil lost. Choose Jesus. Is that a good, easy way to remember? You know, sometimes the kids get revelation better than the adults do because they understand the dragon is bad and the prince is good and the prince wins. We, on the other hand, sometimes are so full of charts that we lose the message of revelation, which is, in two words, Jesus wins. And so the three angels are coming to say, hey, the creator God, the one who created, he has also won. Don't forget these are messengers. How lovely the feet of him who brings the eternal gospel that God has won. So this is the first victorious picture of Jesus. The lamb that is not just slain, as in chapter 5 of Revelation, not just standing, not just the Alpha and the Omega, but now he's standing on Zion with his people, and he has won. That's the first picture for tonight. The second picture is as powerful and as victorious. But in order to understand it, I need to take you to the beginning of the Bible. So please go to Exodus chapter 12. See, all the topics of the Bible will end up in a ta-da, Jesus wins. All of them. Choose any of them. Exodus 12 is the Passover lamb. Here we have another victorious picture of Jesus. Chapter 12 in Exodus, verse 21, we get the beginning of a topic that will be revealed later. Chapter 12, verse 21, Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourself lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the doorpost and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians and when he sees the blood on the lintel, the same thing that he did with Rahab later on because the cord was scarlet and anybody that was in that house would be saved. Don't, don't, don't miss the symbols in the Bible because they are all pointing to the blood of Jesus. Verse 23, the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the dentil and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door, will not allow the destroyer to come in. Well, we all know the Passover story. Chapter 14, they get delivered. They, God opens a way where there was no way. God opens a way where there was no way, and a song erupts. Chapter 15 of Exodus. Most of your Bibles will have a title there that said, The Song of Moses. The Song of Moses is a song about this incredible acts that God has done. Incredible acts. One of them, the redemption of his people, verse 15. Actually, let's do verse 13. Chapter 15, verse 13. In your loving kindness, you have left the people who you have redeemed. Incredible word. You are leading the people who you have redeemed to the promised land. And we're all going, woohoo, woohoo. But this is the beginning of the topic. Miriam does something very interesting. Verse 20, Exodus 15, verse 20. I love these two verses. What would I give for every person in the Adventist church to take a timbrel in their hand? Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, 
took the timbrel in her hand when they crossed over. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing, and they started to sing a song. Now, the first question I have for you is, who packs a timbrel? I mean, somebody tells you, we're going to go to the desert. For two months, we're going to walk. And you're choosing to pack lightly. And you say, oh, I know. I know what I should have in my bag. A timbrel. How many of you brought your timbrels to camp meeting? You forgot your timbrels? Miriam says, hey, I need a timbrel. Who packs a timbrel? Well, I'm going to show you the timbrels they used to have there. This is one of the timbrels. It was made of skin. That was a timbrel. And then, of course, the one we know more. You know, Miriam says, okay, I have my sandals. I have a change of clothing, maybe some water for the first two days. And, yeah, a timbrel. Who packs a timbrel? Somebody who is expecting something so big from God, some great deliverance that they have to celebrate. They have to be joyful. They have to cry out, Jesus wins. They have to hold a, a, a fork in their hands. In this case, she holds the timbrel and starts singing and dancing and praising God for the redeeming acts. All right. Now, that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. This is why I love to follow and connect the dots. And I'm going to show you one that woo, is going to blow your mind away. The Exodus keeps being developed it throughout the whole Old Testament. More and more and more and more. Until we get to a very interesting dialogue in the Gospel of Luke. Go to Gospel of Luke chapter 9. This is a transfiguration account where the law and the prophets are going to show up to encourage Jesus. Luke chapter 9 is the transfiguration account and is the only account of all the Gospels that tell us what Moses and Elijah talked to Jesus about. The other Gospels said that they talked together, that they, you know, that he was in his glory and that the disciples saw this and we don't have time for all of it. But only Luke tells us what they talked about. Luke chapter 9, verse 30. Behold, two men, very important men, who represented the law and the prophets. Two men were talking with him, and they were who? Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory, were speaking of his, and now I don't know what your version says, departure or death or whatever it is, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But the, the issue is that there's a big word there that most translators have missed. So I'm going to show it to you in the interlinear Bible. Now, I always tell people, buy an interlinear English-Greek, because even if you don't speak Greek, the Greek under the English is literal. And so you can find all these pearls inside the Word of God. So let's do the slide. This is exactly what it says on the Greek. And I'm going to read it directly there. We get the slide of, the, of this passage. Please, Luke chapter 9, verse 31. We don't have it yet. I have to wait for it. Luke chapter, there we go. Now, I'm going to read it to you from 931. See where it says 931? Who having appeared in glory were speaking of the, and what's the word? The exodus of him which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Can you imagine now Moses coming to cheer up Jesus? And tell him, oh, that exodus, that was just a symbol of what you were going to do in Jerusalem. You are going to do the real exodus. I know the faces of the people that are coming out of slavery. I've seen them go out of Egypt. You, on the other hand, will bring them to the promised land because you will accomplish the exodus at the cross. Isn't that a big word? And Moses showed up, not just anybody. Moses, the one that had delivered the people in the first exodus, came and said to Jesus, can we put the slide again? He appeared in glory, and he specifically came to tell him, you, having appeared in glory, were speaking of the exodus of him, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. 
Wow! But we're in the middle of the Bible. We haven't even gone to the end. He was the Passover lamb. He accomplished the exodus. God made a way where there was no way. And at some point, we got to grab the timbrels. Well, in Revelation, we grab the timbrels. Never, never, never mistaken reverence with depression. I have gone to some churches that I wouldn't take my neighbors if you paid me. You know, and let me tell you something. If there is no joy in your church, Jesus is not there. You know, the gospel fills you with such joy that you can't stop it. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, it will come a, become a fountain inside of you, the gospel. It will be like, woo, 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 and you won't be able to stop it. You can go blue in the face doing seminars on evangelism until people don't get the gospel, good news, you're being set free. They're not going to go out, woohoo. They're not. So it's so important that we get the gospel because that's where fear goes out the window and joy takes over the churches. And so <laughs> if you're not used to worshiping, you're going to have a big surprise in heaven. Revelation is a book of worship because everybody is going, woohoo! the 24 elders and the creatures and the angels and the people, everybody, Jesus wins, Jesus wins. And Revelation 15 is the scene again of crossing over the sea. Now we know what the real exodus was. Revelation 15 starting on verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Verse 2, and I saw something like a sea. Oh, yes, remember the sea? The sea of glass, this time, mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, they were standing on the sea of glass, and they didn't have timbrels, they had something else. They were holding harps. And they were singing a song. And this was a song that we already have seen in Exodus 14 and 15. But this time we get that, ta-da! And this is the way it goes, verse 3. And they sang the song of Moses, the bond servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Because now we understand that the song of Moses was the song of the Lamb, because Exodus was the symbol of the opening of a way where there was no way, and we're on our way to the promised land, and get your timblers, your harps, your forks, or whatever you want, but start saying Jesus wins. And so the song of Moses is the song of the Lamb. So here we have the cross being the Exodus, the way. And so they were singing. Let's read it, verse 3. And they sang the song of Moses, the bond servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Oh, here we have two of the most powerful pictures of Jesus as victor. The Lamb standing on Zion. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news and says to Zion, your God reigns. The three angels come. Yes, he wins. Yes, he wins. Yes, he wins. You've been set free. The other king is down. Woohoo! Then on chapter 15, the exodus now. We crossed over. The Passover lamb has been sacrificed, says Paul. You can start celebrating that you're going to be passed over because the lamb has overcome. Wow, I would give everything I have for our churches to get the cry, arise and shine with Jesus wins, Jesus wins. So at one point, the church can't take it anymore, <laughs> and they have to join and the bride, at one point, 
we are given the incredible, <laughs> this is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. In the last chapter of the Bible, the bride starts joining in to call people in. You know, it's not just the spirit, it's not just the three angels, it's not just this, and it's not just that. The bride has been standing there, dressed in white by the blood of the lamb, and, they, and the bride has to invite people to come. And so in one of the most amazing verses of all of Revelation, the bride joins in with the spirit. Chapter 22, verse 17. The spirit and the church, the spirit and the bride say, Please come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. The, see, the church can't take it anymore. It's like, come, 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 because Jesus wins. The gospel is the victory cry that our king has fought and has won and you have been set free. Can you imagine what our churches would be? But I know that we are faced with our uncertainty. There's cancer and there's diseases and there's death and there's divorces and there's abortion and there's porn addiction. There's things that are happening among us. And Jesus is saying, look, my grace is sufficient for the whole thing. There's not one detour you took that is too much for me. My arms are long enough to save you. Come, 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 and join the winning team because Jesus wins. Now, I want to challenge you before we see the last video. What if we all grabbed our timbrels now before we cross over? Because Jesus already has won. The Passover lamb has been sacrificed. The exodus is for sure. We're going home. Our rise and shine is the cry that we are going home because the lamb is victorious. So what if we grab our timbrels now? What if we grab our forks now? I have never seen anybody die with the gratitude and the positive attitude of my mother. She was a person that always had the timbrel. She was the funniest, most grateful person. And she says, you know, I'm dying with such assurance, she says, that I'm taking a little nap, but I already know that the best is still to come. What a way to live or die with a timbrel in our hands saying, Jesus wins, Jesus wins. Arise and shine, bride. It's time to say, what the gospel is. The gospel is the cry that Jesus has fought and won on our behalf. We're going to end tonight's presentation with a video, which is the last few words in the book of Revelation. This is John, the apostle. And then I just want to invite you to do something with me. So this, this is chapter 21, the bride new heaven, new earth, no more cancer, no more tears, no more disease. What do you say if we arise and let him shine? Jesus wins. How do we summarize the whole Bible in two words? Jesus wins. How do we summarize it in three words? Ta-da! Jesus wins. What do you say we grab our forks and we go out there with the message of the gospel? How lovely are the feet of him who brings the gospel and says to Zion, your God reigns. Stand with me. We're just going to sing a cappella. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the king. And guess what? No more crying there. We are going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You're going to see the king. Because how is it that we summarize Revelation? Jesus wins. Let's pray. Oh, dear Lord. The Lamb is standing in Zion, victorious. The eternal gospel that said there would be good news is a reality already. The Passover Lamb has been sacrificed. We're on our way to our heavenly home. Please make the bride arise and shine, that the bride will join with passion, joy, and celebration in this invitation, come. The Spirit and the bride says, come. And whoever wishes, and whoever's thirsty, whoever wants to, come and drink of the water of life without cost. With a, without cost to us, but it cost you your life. Thank you for being the victor, the new Moses, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Make our churches centers of joy and celebration that we may live or die with a fork in our hands, saying very, very loud, Jesus wins. In the name of the Lamb who is victorious and is coming soon, I pray. Amen. God bless you. See you tomorrow.